So I chose this title, which is about analysis of atmospheric model with moisture. But then I realized since I'm the first speaker in this workshop, maybe somebody has uh, to give some kind of like, I wouldn't say introduction, but a quick of landmark of what's happening in the, in the, in the, in the field. And this is a biased and certainly cannot be comprehensive in particular that I would like to get to my, the subject of my talk. So therefore I will start with the Nadir Stokes equations. And these are the Nadir Stokes equations say for, for, for periodic boundary condition to avoid issues related to the boundaries. So what we know about the Nadir Stokes equation actually since the work of Leray, so in three dimensional case, we have global existence of weak solutions which satisfies energy inequality. And we have short term existence of strong solutions and uniqueness of strong solutions we do have. The open problems are the uniqueness of Leray Hopf weak solution, namely weak solutions satisfy energy inequality, as well as the global existence of strong solutions. This is uh, the issues about the Nadir Stokes equation. However, there are many work concerning criteria of what could go wrong about existence uniqueness. And again, I'm not gonna go into the most fancy criteria, etc. but one of the classical and something which is easy to explain is uh, uh, this regularity criteria. If the L6 norm to the power four is integrable in time for this interval of time, therefore we know that the weak solution coincides with the strong solutions and it is unique up to the time T, namely there is no singularity of the strong solution up to that time T. Now this is one of the criteria which is I will use later when I will talk about my, my, my models However, it is a part of a family of criteria, which is usually known in the community as the producerian conditions, but then also sometimes called the Janska producerian conditions. And there is some work by Poyash in this direction. So this is the general name, and which is tells us that if the, if the a, a weak solution, which is start with initial data in H1, which is for short time, it is strong, is in the space LP in time, LQ in space, then the strong solution and the weak solutions are the same and therefore the strong solution exists and nice up to time capital T. So if you take P equals to four and Q equals to six, this is a particular case of the situation. Now the case of P equals to infinity, Q equals to three was really later uh, uh, done by, by, by uh, this uh, group, by Esperazia, uh, Seriegin and Schwerak. Now, I, as I said, I'm just giving you very, very fast exposition about what's happening as landmarks in order to warm up toward this workshop. So in the case of viscosity equal to zero, the Euler equation, the traditional work, the old work, Lichtenstein 95, says that if initial data is in C1 alpha and that there exists a short time of solutions which remains in the space C1 alpha. So you have well positiveness in the space C1 alpha. And we all have heard in this in the tutorial last week by Tarek el Gindi, in which they show that there are solutions which start in the space C0 alpha and alpha is a small for which you have singularity in finite time. Uh, but uh, this is a result that we, we have. But nonetheless, this is a classical result. Now, there is some other work by Eben Marsden, and there's some result by Kato Anlai, which is not very popular, which is these with the boundary conditions or the case with bounded domains, in which says that if the initial data in the space HS for S bigger than five over two, you have short time existence and uniqueness. So this is in some sense, the quote to quote modern function analytical techniques versus the old classical spaces techniques, but you know, from HS and for S bigger than five over two and C1 alpha, they are intimately related. So in some sense, this is a translation. Like if this result is written in Latin, this result is written in Italian. So it's like the same result, but in different uh, context, different language. Now the question for a long time has been, does there exist global weak solutions for the 3D Euler equation? And this is in some sense for any initial data. This has been an open problem for a long time, and the result has been settled by Wedman, Emil Wedman, I will talk about in February 2011, in which he proved that for every initial data that you give me in the, in the right spaces, you have not only one weak solution, but there are infinitely many weak solutions. In other words, that if it, if it, if it, you know, if it rains, it pours. And this is a based on the convex integration machinery, which I will touch upon. As I said, this is just landmark of what's happening, the progress, and what were the issues, the main issues in the field. So uh, similar to the producerian conditions in the Navier Stokes case, there were some criteria, which is for the bill cut omega that the L infinity norm of omega is under control, then the Euler equation is under control. There are many, many results that people say, this is the bill cut for different kind of equations, 
Well, I would like just to mention among the, some young people here for the history, the Bill Katumaida was for Euler, namely for the Invisit case. Usually, the, 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 if you would like to call criteria of regularity concerning dissipative system or system with viscosity, they most likely will be along the lines of the Prodiserin rather than Bill Katumaida. But nonetheless, this is a matter of just a, a side comment. So this is the criteria for regularity for 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 uh, Euler equation, and many people have been tracking this quantity when they're searching for singularity concerning Euler equation. There is some other more fancy conditions. This is condition by Konstantin Peterman Maida, which is says if you look to the direction of the vorticity rather than the the, the vorticity. So uh, uh, this is says if this is a Lipschitz plus some other uh, condition then uh, the, you have regularity for Euler equation. Again, I'm just going very quickly just to show some of the like, uh, like, uh, like uh, reader's digest of what's been happening. Of course, I'm missing many, many results and many of them are important. So it's just it's a way just to warm up toward this uh, situation. So what happens with the, with the weak solutions of the 3D Euler equation? I say that basically Whitman used the convex, uh, convex integration machinery and proved that the existence of weak solution, which are there's non unique there's infinitely many weak solutions of, uh, of, of Euler equation. But this has been, as I said, the, based on the machinery of the H principle, which was introduced to our community in fluid mechanics by Deleuze and Sikahidi, in which they showed that there is non trivial uh, infinite, uh, infinite family of, of weak solutions, which are compact support in space and time. And I like to call these solutions, at least the first one that had been introduced as a nightmare solutions. They call them wild solution. Nightmare is just a, a joking because this is solution is, if you think about it, you have a glass of water, you take it next to you, so it is inside the, the compact in the glass and it is settled, it's quiet, it's not moving. And then in the middle of the night, the solution becomes then trivial. So the water starts moving on its own. You think there is a ghost in the room and therefore you tick and sleep. And then in the morning, the solution is zero again because it's compact in time. And then when you wake up, you see that the water is not moving. So you say, oh, it's not, it must have been like, like a, a, a nightmare and not a ghost in the room. So this is kind of like the metaphor for these solutions. They are certainly not physical, at least these solutions. And then the question becoming, how can we select from all this infinite family of solutions, which one could be physical and so on and so forth. And this is subject of interest and of ongoing research in the community. So the present proof of these results is not really traditional TDE. It is uh, shares some of the ideas from differential geometry, like Nash Kuiper uh, embedding theorem of, of uh, embedding theorem of of of, uh, of uh, uh, isometric embedding of surfaces. Okay, and again, as I said, there will be many lectures, or maybe there have been many lectures about the subject. I'm just basically going very quickly about this. Now, I would like to mention that this kind of like solutions have been earlier introduced by Schumann and Schaeffer into the community, but at least the machinery of convex integration H principle. Uh, allows us to put hands on things and try to understand better what is going on there. So one real, some kind of like criteria for selection, or in my case, I'm less ambitious about selection mechanism of uniqueness, but maybe there is no uniqueness indeed in many systems. And therefore, maybe we should rule out solutions which are not really physical. And this is, a, 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 in some sense, as I said, there's no uniqueness. So the question, which one of the solutions we should rule out as non-physical? And seemingly, at least, the ones which is contracted with compact support, at least in my opinion, none of them is physical except the zero solution, because, you know, you cannot create energy from, from nothing. And, uh, the, but nonetheless, the machinery in different contexts has introduced so much, and therefore we need, in some sense, to really explore very well this machinery in order to get more physical intuition and, and, and relate these kind of solutions to turbulence and so on and so forth. So uh, the question, as I say, is naturally, what are the selections or ruling out uh, criteria? And I will touch upon this. So now I would like to talk about this particular example, which has been introduced to the community by the Perna and Maida, and has been a, 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 a ex explored by Bardosa and myself, which is the shear flow. Namely, if you take a function which is locally in, in, in L2, in R, then this is a specific solution of Euler, which is a weak solution of Euler equation. With the, pressure, with the pressure equals to zero. Now, in particular, if the psi and phi are periodic in R, then this solution has finite energy, and the solution is in L2 of R, which is constant energy. The energy is conserved. So in particular, this is an example in which the 
solution can be very rough. It cannot be more rough than L2, which conserves the energy. So this is, in some sense, tells you that, I'm not gonna talk about Onsager conjecture, but uh, this is, tells you that the, 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 the other side of the Onsager conjecture, namely when the solutions are rough, there are examples, and this is a program that's been done by, 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 uh, by the, the group, I don't know if anybody's gonna talk about, in which it shows that the solution can be C0 alpha for alpha less than one third, but they don't conserve energy, while the, this is basically the other part of the Onsager conjecture. However, this gives you examples that also you can be rough solution and do conserve the energy. However, this example has been used mostly by, uh, mainly by Bardos and myself to show the following, that if you start initial data in C0 alpha, at later time, the solution here, because of this composition, belongs to the space C0 alpha square which is alpha square less than alpha. In other words, you immediately leave the space C0 alpha, which means that Euler equation is ill-posed in the space of C0 alpha. Of course, there was no short-time existence in unities. There was a result of, uh, of Liechtenstein about C1 alpha. But this shows that the space C0 alpha is ill-posed space. So C1 alpha is well-posed, C0 alpha is ill-posed. And there's the question, what happens with C1? This is, in some sense, maybe motivated some of the work by El Gindi and Masmoudi and independently Borgen and Lee, in which they show the Euler equation in the space CM when M an integer, one, two, three, four, five, it's ill-posed. Namely, if you start initial data there, you don't necessarily remain in that particular space. And this is because, in some sense, the Ries transform is not a bounded operator from L infinity to L infinity or from C0 to C0. And this is the capitalize on this fact in order to show because of the Biot-Savar and all kind of like other properties, why the Euler equation is ill-posed in the space CM. This is a, a nice work in which basically you need to explore the situation with the, with, the, with the risk transform. Now, if you look at this space CM, it's a very regular functions, but M has to be an integer. If you are not the integer CM comma alpha, then you are okay in that sense, again, because the singular integrals operators are good from C0 alpha to C0 alpha, but not from Cm to Cm. Now, what if you look for the very, very nice spaces, like the space of the most regular function, which is like analytic function? Of course, in this case, uh, there is a result of Bardos, and uh, so, 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 so the, if you look at this particular example, uh, I would like to explore it further. There is an old result about uh, the case of Euler equation in the space of analytic functions. So Bardos and Ben Ashur showed short time well positiveness in the space of analytic functions. However, and this I would like to emphasize, the radius of entity might change. Might change, it doesn't have to shrink, it could even grow because by the way, the equation is reversible in time. So if it's going downwards, forward in time, it goes upward, backwards in time. So therefore it changes. This is the result in which you remain analytic, but the radius of entity is shrinking. Now, if you look to this shear flow, uh, in fact, it's, uh, uh, one can show that if you start with analytic initial data, phi and psi are initial data are analytic, one can construct immediately example for which the radius of analyticity is shrinking. In fact, this has been a remark in the, one, in the paper of uh, Kukalika and, and Weichel saying that basically, let's take this example and you can show that there is some this change. Aha, what this means? This means that it's a simple observation. If you look at Euler equation, and you look for the initial data in a space where the radius of authenticity is fixed, and I look into solutions where the radius of authenticity is fixed, then the solutions do not remain in this. And therefore, if you want to think about it, the Euler equation, quote to quote, is imposed in the space of analytic functions if I insist the regularity, namely the radius of authenticity is not changing or not shrinking. So this is, in some sense, the generalization of this result of C, M, but now in the space of analytic functions, because if the radius of entity is shrinking, in some sense you are losing uh, uh, regularity in some uh, in some in some way or another. Okay, so now what happens with the uh, with the with this? Uh, I would like to continue with this convex integration machinery. So, do two-dimensional flows remain two-dimensional flows? Well, uh, this is an observation which is uh, we have made concerning the. The, the, the weak solutions of Euler equation. One can really construct using the convex integration machinery, can construct initial data which is periodic, but does not depend on the Z function. 
However, you can construct solution that suddenly becoming function of X, Y, and Z, sort of bifurcate. This is some kind, something not natural here. And then the question was asked, what about Nadir Stokes? Do the solutions of Nadir Stokes, if they start function of X, Y, namely they are two-dimensional, do they remain function of X, Y? I'm talking about weak solution. In fact, it has been overlooked point by the community because when people talk about 2D Nadir Stokes equation, it is an ansatz. People assume that you start function of XY or remain function of XY, and then we prove all the theorem. And when you talk about 3D, then you assume you start function of X, Y, and Z, and remain function of X, Y, Z. So the observation we have is the following. Luckily, if the initial data is function of X, Y, and then a Lerayhoff weak solution of the 3D Euler equation, which is function of X, Y, only the initial data, remains function of X, Y. And this is basically using somehow the serine a kind of like a weak, strong uniqueness condition to show the stability. So in other words, we are really saved by the bill that weak solutions or the ray of weak solutions of Euler, which is function of XY, do remain function of XY, and therefore all what we have been doing is okay. Similar results concerning Navier Stokes with axis symmetric. If I start axis symmetric and I look for weak solutions, say if I avoid the axis, if I look for a solution between two pipes, or if I'm helical, why should the solutions remain function of uh, helical symmetry or, 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 or axis symmetric uh, solution? There's no reason of why this is be the situation. And as a result, one has to really investigate that. And again, because uh, if you look for the ray hopic solution, one can show that indeed this symmetry is preserved for the Navier Stokes equation. And now the question, what about the situation in Euler? This is not the case in Euler. So if U0 is function of XY, then the weak solutions of the 3D Euler must become function of XY and Z. And similarly, the axis symmetric, you can start initially axis symmetric, but immediately by the convex integration machine, you can construct weak solution when not axis symmetric or helical. And uh, so the symmetry is, is, is preserved. And this is a, leads us to think about what's the connection between Navier-Stokes and Euler and we would like to capitalize on that as a ruling out uh, mechanism, namely solutions which are not limit of weak solution, the of weak solution of Navier Stokes, maybe should be ruled out on physical ground as, 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 as good solutions for Euler equation. In particular, because of this kind of theorem that we have here, all these solutions which is starting function of XY and become function of XYZ should not be considered as physical solutions of Euler. Of course, I'm talking about in the absence of boundaries, physical boundaries. Similar with axis symmetric situation where you break the symmetry should not be because they are not limit of Larry Hope weak solution. Uh, and uh, this is basically the ruling out the uh, criteria uh, in the absence of physical boundary, weak solution of Euler equation, which cannot be achieved as limit of Nadia Stokes equation as the viscosity goes to zero, maybe should be ruled out as physical solution. Now, uh, another example to support this idea is this, uh, this, uh, this uh, shear flow. If I start with this initial data, I can construct infinitely many weak solutions of Euler using the convex integration machinery. However, if you solve the, the Nadir stocks with this kind of initial value, one can show that the only solution is uh, the shear flow, which can be achieved as a limit from the Nadir stocks equation. Okay, let's uh, go ahead. Now, what about the effect of rotation? If you look to Euler equations and you add rotation because I would like to move more into geophysical flows because this is like Coriolis force. Uh, this term, which is anti-symmetric, so it's not involved at all in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the energy estimates and stuff like that. And therefore people for a long time said with rotation, without rotation, we are facing the same kind of like problem. And then the question becoming, does the rotation helps? Because geophysicists believe that fast rotation indeed uh, 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 stratify the fluid and makes it more closer to become two dimensional. And as a result, we know in 2D Euler, everything is okay. And this is a, a, a problem that uh, has been investigated long time ago by many groups. The first work was by Embiid and Maida in which they looked for the limit equation as omega goes to infinity. Bobby Malov and Nikolaenko took advantage of that. And in the periodic case, they proved the result of the following type. Like if you give me time of existence and initial data, then there is a rate of rotation such that if you are faster than that, you can guarantee the existence up to this, this time. In other words, you can prolong the time of existence or lifespan 
as omega becoming uh, larger and, and larger. There is also a, 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 a nice book and uh, results in the full space by Shema, uh, Desjardins, Gallagher, and Rayet. There is some work also by Masmoudi, some other work by Zayan. And in the context of Burger's equation, there is a result by Liu and Tadmor. And I will not talk much about it, but I would like to give the example. So if you look for Burger's equation, we know that Burger's equation blows up in finite time, namely it has a singularity in finite time because of the shocks. However, if you look into the Burgess equation with, in the complex domain, you complexify things. So this is an observation by Babin, Lillian, and myself. If I look at u to be complex function as a function of z variable, which is complex analytic, so this u sub z means derivative as, as, as a holomorphic function, one can solve this equation, can show short time existence and uniqueness. This is, plays the role of rotation. And as a result, one can show the following, this is, I would, I would like, if you do the change of variables, sorry, if you go to the change of variables V equals to that, then one can really show that V satisfying this equation. And therefore, if you look to the derivative, is there a shock in V? You find the V dz satisfying this relationship. And now one can guarantee that the denominator is not zero provided omega large enough. Is omega large enough? Depending on the initial value, I can remain, make sure that the absolute value of all these shebang in absolute very strictly less than one and therefore there is no singularity so therefore rotation is preventing the singularity this is a simple example and i think in his lecture slim ibrahim will probably explore this further when he talks about the effect of rotation in the primitive equation so i don't want to uh, talk much about it and however what is the physical effect here if i look at the at the integrated version of the equation so v is equal to the initial data plus this averaging. Now, because of this averaging, and you have e to the i omega, then e to the i omega is very oscillatory and omega is very large. It makes this term weak because of the Riemann, uh, the, the riemann lebesgue lemma. And as a result, this quantity is small when omega is very large. So it can have the balance. This is say is big, this is big, this is super big, but because of the averaging, it makes it big. Therefore, big is equivalent to big. And that's how you can make the balance and you can show that you don't have singularity in finite time. And this is, as I said, because of the riemann lebesgue lemma, which is an averaging principle. Simple, simple observation, but nonetheless, it tells us what the role of rotation in this, uh, in this equation. Now I move to the geophysical flows. So I'm looking for planetary scales. So at the scales of like thousands and tens of thousands of, 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 of kilometers, okay? This is like the planetary scales. And it is a norm that you have like big currents that we would like to capture. So if I start with the Rayleigh-Denard convection or Bosanist equation, this is like the conservation of momentum. So this is the Navier-Stokes, and this is like the Coriolis force. And this is the buoyancy because of the temperature change. This is the incompressibility, and this is the heat equation. So if I am looking into this equation and decompose into horizontal, namely into the planet because I'm looking for a horizontal parallel in the ocean or in the atmosphere. And the W is the vertical. So wherever you put CH means horizontal. So then I decompose the momentum equation horizontal. And this is the vertical. And this is the incompressibility. And this is the temperature. Now, what happens in this case, if you take typical orders of magnitude for scales in the ocean, so the horizontal scale is order of, 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 uh, of uh, like, uh, 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 thousands of kilometers, and uh, this is uh, uh, the typical velocity in the ocean, this is typical depth in the ocean, which is like order of few kilometers. This is the Coriolis force, the rotation, and this is the gravity, and this is the density of the, of the, of, of the water. If I put this, I, from this I can conclude a typical vertical velocity is of this order, typical pressure is of this order, and this is the typical time scale of interest. If I look into the vertical conservation of momentum and plug in this quantities, you realize that this is like 10 to the minus 11, minus 11, minus 11, 10 and 10. And you can see that these first three terms in the context of planetary scales, they are negligible in comparison to these terms. And therefore, if you drop the first three terms, you remain with this balance, which is called the hydrostatic balance. And this is the motivation behind the hydrostatic balance in the planetary and uh, scales in the atmosphere and in the, in the ocean. This is, will lead us into the following equation, which is called the primitive equation. 
This is the, again the conservation momentum, but only the horizontal component, the vertical component is replaced by the hydrostatic balance, incompressibility, and the temperature. So this equation has been introduced by Richardson in 1922. Leon's Timam and Wang gave some asymptotic derivation formal of that. Uh, Jin Kai Lee and myself, 2011, gave rigorous justification of the primitive equation based on the global existence result. And even we can show the rate of convergence, namely how do solutions of Navier Stokes for well-prepared initial data as the aspect ratio go to zero, they, 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 they converge to the primitive equation. I would, this, I would touch upon this very, very quickly. This is some of the previous results concerning the, the primitive equations. As I said, I would like to, to get into the heart of, the, of, of my lecture, namely a little bit about the moisture. So the result we have is the global existence for the primitive equations, uh, which is a, 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 an, an old result with Chongqing Tsao. So as I said, these are the equations. Now what happens if you don't have full viscosity, if you look into partial viscosity, anisotropic viscosity or anisotropic diffusion, because in the, sometimes in the, in the, in the ocean, etc., the molecular viscosity is small, but you have a strong turbulence, which is, gives you sort of like eddy viscosity. So studying this, uh, oh, um, I, I, I will jump on the proof. I will not talk about the proof, so I will jump the, this part because I don't have time, and maybe many of you have heard it, so this is an old result. I just basically wanted to talk about uh, the, the, just the, 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 okay, sorry about that. I will talk mainly about, uh, forget about the, this anisotropic case. I will move into, into the approximation, the, 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 the aspect ratio. So as I said, if you look to this aspect ratio, which is very small, then if I rescale, this is in this domain, very thin domain. If you rescale the equation, you get the scaled Navier Stokes equation. Formally, when epsilon equals to zero, you get the hydrostatic balance. And as I said, then this is the equation, which is one get, which is the primitive equation. And now you would like to compare the solutions of the scaled Navier Stokes to the solution here. And this is the theorem that we have with Jin Kai Lee, in which we show the following result that if we have initial data is in H1, then one can show that all the weak solutions of the navier stokes equation starting from this initial V0, okay, the solutions of the scales are converging in this particular norm. Notice there is no uniqueness of the weak solutions, but all of them be, remain within a vicinity square root of epsilon in these norms of the solution of the primitive equation. So this is some sense justified the, the solution. Now, if the initial data is stronger, then one can show that not only that the scaled Navier Stokes equation has a solution, but the strong solution exists and globally in time and remains within vicinity order epsilon within the solution of the primitive uh, equation. Okay, as I said, this is the anisotropic case. I will skip it uh, because I don't have much time. I wanna, uh, uh, I wanna be, since I'm the first speaker, I probably have to try as much as possible to obey the, the time. Uh, so I will I will I will skip these uh, these parts about about the anisotropic viscosity and anisotropic diffusion, in which we have the result. However, uh, we have so many results in the case of only partial viscosity, horizontal or vertical. As I said, it's motivated in some sense by turbulence in the viscosity in the ocean because the molecular viscosities are small, and we have global existence and uniqueness under many scenarios, which is motivates the next question: What happens? if you don't have viscosity at all in the implicit equation. So this is the result of uh, Cao, Ibrahim, uh, Nakanishi, and myself. It has been independently also done by Wong. And this is the primitive equation without rotation. And we have shown that the primitive equation without rotation in the implicit case develops singularity in finite time, develops a shock in finite time. And again, I don't want to take uh, away from the lecture of uh, Slim Ibrahim. He will talk about this result and he will talk about generalization in the case you add a rotation term, we also have singularity in finite time, namely there's a blow up. So the, the, the rotation does not prevent completely the formation of singularity. However, under certain circumstances for the right initial data, which is a, say analytic initial data, one shall, has short time existence and uniqueness, and one can show that the rotation does prolong the life of existence. There's some results earlier about short time existence for analytic data by 
by Vlad, uh, by Timam, Igor, and uh, I think also uh, Micheli Potazialati involved in that. I don't know if Zayan is involved, I forgot. So correct me and forgive me, I forgot that. Nonetheless, so this is, uh, I will not talk about it. Now I will move into the tropical atmosphere and things with moisture. So in the tropics, the wind is in the lower atmosphere and the troposphere and the upper one, they go in opposite sign. And therefore, roughly speaking, one can model that the wind in some sense is captured by the first mode, cosine z. Okay, so if you decompose the solutions into something called barotropic mode, namely the average in the z direction, and the baroclinic mode, which is the fluctuation around this average. So you take the first mode of the baroclinic, it will have a cosine. If you take this into account, so this is the barotropic mode, namely this is the average in the z direction. And now instead of having a full Fourier expansion with cosine, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so on and so forth. You take only the first mode, you take an ansatz, and you take this as a solution, and you do the Galerkin, and, and you truncate. Then one gets the following system, and this is a work by uh, Ferrarson, Maida, and Paul Wee in 2004. One gets the following equation. As I said, u is a function of xy, and v is a function of xy. And let me tell you who's u and v. u is the barotropic mode, and v is the coefficient, which is a function of x and y of the baroclinic mode cosine z. So therefore, this is a, 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 the equation with, the, the, with u is incompressible, but I don't have incompressibility on v. And then there's the equation of the temperature, which is, has a source for the temperature. So this is the model of the troposphere in some sense. Now, I have here the plus sign with red. Why I have the plus sign with red? Because of the following comment. Suppose I don't have temperature. If the temperature is not, equation is not here at all, then the equation is the same like the MHD equation with the exception that the sign is reversed. So this sign here is minus in the primitive equation, in the, in the MHD equation. Notice that in the MHD equation, the velocity field is incompressible, but the magnetic field, initially it is incompressible, and one can show because this sign is minus that the divergence of the magnetic field is constant or does not change and therefore if it's initially zero it remains zero and this is allows for really investigating the viscous primitive equation in, in sorry mhd equations in 2d here i have the plus sign and therefore i don't have this particular property and therefore dv equal to zero even if it's initially like that it is no longer therefore i have compressibility and uh, now one would like to study this particular equation so if you take the moisture Q, which is transported, and there is some effect because of the compressibility of the baroclinic mode, plus the P, which is the precipitation, and the precipitation has one over epsilon, which is a quick factor in which after you pass a threshold, then you have rain. Before that, there is no rain. This is basically the, 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 the precipitation. And if you do all this shebang, the model introduced by Farizon, Maida, and Paul Lui is exactly this equation, but now instead of having only one equation for the temperature, we have equation for the temperature and equation for the moisture, which is given by this relationship. And now this is here the uh, right-hand side in which basically when you exceed the threshold, very quickly you will have some change transition. And you have here Q plus, which is the plus function, which is the maximum between zero and QE. Now, one would like to really investigate this particular equation. Observe the following, that if you'd like to do numerics, because you have one over epsilon, you have a very fast phenomena taking place. And therefore, you have to take delta t very small. And people in numerical analysis do not like to compute things which is, has very fast time scale. So this is, allows us or motivates us to study what happens to the limit as epsilon go to zero. And if the equation at the limit exists and does not depend on epsilon, maybe one can compute it. And maybe if we can relate the epsilon equation with the limit equation by approximating them, then solving numerically the, the limit equation and then comparing with this one, one can really get something. If you take formally the limit of this, you don't have differential system, but you have differential equation coupled with differential inequalities. And one has, this is the limit system. 
Now what we can show that the limit system has existence and uniqueness despite the fact that you have inequality, one has to really work a little bit here about how to prove inequality in the case of differential inequalities. And one can show the following results. So the result that we have with the Jinkai Li is global well positiveness and justification of the nonlinear relaxation as epsilon goes to zero. And we showed that the limit is of the order square root of epsilon. So we have an error estimates on the convergence, which is important for numerical computation. Earlier we asked by a real result by Maida and Suganitis, in which they studied the linearized version of the system. And in the inviscid case, here we use the viscosity, but they, they studied the linearized case and, uh, and uh, the result of that case. So now I will move into the moisture uh, uh, model with the, with, the, with the cloud. So in the, in the clouds, uh, you have basically the concentration of water. I'm talking about warm clouds. Warm clouds means I'm assuming there's no ice. So this is a QJ is the ratio between the density of a certain phase with respect to the dry air. V is vapor, C is for cloud rain, for, for, for water in the cloud, and R is for rain. This is the cycle of how things change from one phase to the other, depending on some shred hold. And therefore, if you are bigger than this, something happens. If you are less than this, something else happens. And the model that one has in this case, that there are some sources, and these sources, you see that it has the plus function, and we have to exceed some threshold for something to happen. And now the model that we have is that each one of those quantities, namely the vapor, uh, the, the, the vapor, the, the rain, water in the cloud, and the rainwater, they satisfy these transport equations with all kind of sources, and the sources, as I say, given by this kind of like non-linearity. So in some sense, it is sort of non-linear advection, reaction, diffusion, but this is a, the, the reaction part is a little bit weird because it is with the pluses and with the uh, betas, and there's some diffusion process here, and the diffusion is given by this relationship. So let me tell you what is the result that we have here. So there's some boundary conditions, uh, just basically tell you what are the boundary conditions. But the result that we have is the following. Suppose that in the transport, you give me the velocity. So the velocity is given in the advection part. So only I have diffusion, advection with given velocity, but then I have a reaction part. And the reaction right-hand side is the, the, the functions that I mentioned to you. Then one can show that if you initially, the temperature and all these concentrations belongs to an infinity. And if they are non-negative, then they remain non-negative and you have a global existence and uniqueness. What is the big deal here? Why do we issue about the uniqueness? Because, for example, if you look to the equation for the vapor, the concentration of vapor, it has SEV. And SEV has a Q of V, but it has QR to the power beta, which is a fraction. And therefore, the issues of uniqueness, even from ODE, when we have fractional power, there is issue for the ODE. And therefore, one has to do some trick, make change of variables, and then show that the QR appearing only in the QR, but it happens to be in the right side that you have the uniqueness. So therefore, one can show uh, here a, a, a also global existence and uniqueness, but for a given velocity. Now I would like to take this model and couple it to the primitive equations. Now the primitive equations has a global existence when you give me the temperature or when the temperature is evolving for the interaction between them. So the way we do it is that you give me the velocity, I solve for this system, then I can take the temperature, then I solve for the primitive equation, I update the, the velocity, and I do repeating the cycle. And as a result, one can show the global existence and uniqueness even in the context of the primitive equation. So this is the coupled microphysics with the primitive equation. One has also global existence and uniqueness in 3D for this particular model. I would like to mention that there are some other results in, about models with similar about the equation by uh, Koti Zelati, Huang, uh, Kukavika, Timan, and Zian. And uh, now uh, this is an advertisement and I stop here. Now if you move to the compressible primitive equations, why we need compressible? Because in the atmosphere people think that it is more important the compressible part rather than the incompressible. So we have some work with the XNU in which we show global existence and uniqueness for the compressible primitive equation, but with a small initial data, because this is compressible case, we show convergence of the compressible Navier stokes to the compressible primitive equation as the aspect ratio tends to zero. 
because of this small initial data. So therefore, one can really capitalize on that. And we also show the convergence of the compressible primitive equation to the incompressible primitive equation as the Mach number goes to zero. Aha, don't forget that the incompressible primitive has a global existence. Therefore, this result is in some sense for well-prepared initial data is one can show global existence of weak solutions for the compressible primitive equation in that sense. And I think I stop here.